I retired in 2009. Basically, I pulled off a really good deal. I got rid of all the junky parts of my job. I kept all the fun stuff. And so uh, I run a research farm now uh, doing work on crops that no one else has been doing work with. Uh, am I organic? No. But all the work that we do underlies both organic and traditional farming. <coughs> You're going to see here that they're all things that you can use directly on your farm in an organic system. And then once we figure out the best management practices, then we usually start moving it into organic scenarios so that uh, we have maximum use over the widest uh, audience. Uh, what he asked me to talk about today was some work we're doing with uh, double cropping. And uh, we're doing a lot of work with red clover and sorghums, uh, different uh, types of sorghums, as you'll be seeing. The first piece, though, that I want to address is uh, something that has bugged me for a long time. Uh, we grow corn and uh, chop it off, uh, whether it's organic or traditional. Uh, the fields then sit bare over the winter. Uh, Rodale found that there is a huge deterioration over the winter in soil health, soil biology, uh, and the structure of the soil. They did replicated research on it. We also have soil erosion going on right here, uh, and we are leaching nutrients out that then go into uh, the water supply. Uh, that has bugged me for a long time. Uh, we did work with cover crops. We like cover crops, but unfortunately cover crops is something you pay to put in in the fall and then you pay to get rid of in the spring again. And I don't consider that economical. The other piece that we looked at is this is the longest day of the year. Uh, right now we are out here where it's, the sun hasn't shown in three days now or something. Uh, the longest day of the year is June 21st. Uh, we grow crops our summer annuals in there, and then the rest of the year it's just sitting there. We're losing soil structure, soil health, and all those other pieces I uh, just rattled off. What we have done is gone ahead and uh, put in a crop in the winter time, a winter forage. Uh, it's something we plant in the fall, we harvest in the spring, completely off cycle from what we are used to doing. And basically what we're doing is putting a blanket over that soil, uh, it is soaking up any extra nutrients that are in the soil. Uh, they found with composted manure that yes, it feeds the crop nicely in the summertime, but it continues to feed after that crop is harvested. Well, having a winter forage on here soaks those nutrients up, keeps the soil where it is, and you were gonna see in a bit, uh, we found we can utilize this as a manure storage unit. We can store the nutrients in here, and that's part of the research that we have in the ground right now, uh, using it as a green manure storage unit. Now when I talk about winter forages, this is a cover crop, this is winter forage. Cover crops are kind of put out there, yes they grow, uh, you kind of toss them in, you don't put a lot of work into it, you can put them in late, they will come up, uh, they turn green. Uh, does it really help the soil a lot? Uh, there's some real questions when I have rye that's about an inch tall in November. Is that really doing any real good on your soil? Uh, let's be real about it. Winter forage takes more management. It means you put an effort into doing it right. I mean, you could broadcast a disc in corn, but nobody would do it because you know if you plant right, you're going to get a better crop. The same thing happens with winter forages. You put some effort in there. But the reason that we are interested in this also is we discovered this is the best quality forage you can produce in New York. There is nothing that can beat this in terms of feed quality. We're talking about forage for the high cows. Very high digestibility, high sugars, low MDF. This is stuff you can make a lot of meat and milk on. And that is where a lot of the other farms that have jumped on this have really moved because they've seen the results in their herd. You know, regular corn, and for the people that grow the BMR corn, you know, it's a little bit better feed. But then you look at winter forage, in this case, triticale, harvested at the same stage, at the correct stage. You're looking at a lot more milk in every ton of dry matter that you have. And this has been working. 
Organic farms traditionally struggle with high grain prices. High grain prices means more money going out of your pocket and going into somebody else's pocket. High forage diets, which we have been working on since the early 1990s, <coughs> means more money stays in your pocket. But to do that, you need to have high quality feed. And what the farmers have been finding is, yes, this produces high quality feed. So instead of buying a couple hundred pounds of seed, they're buying a pallet. Instead of buying a couple pallets, they're buying half and whole tractor trailer loads, which has been our number one problem is getting enough seed supply built up to meet the needs of the farmers because they're coming back again and again with this. Why? Because it works. And anybody in an organic operation that is, wants to move to a high forage diet, you need to seriously consider putting this crop in your system on a regular basis. It makes money, it makes a pile of money. Now there are a number of winter crops we can use. Barley, rye, winter wheat, winter triticale. Uh, barley, we have an awful time getting it over winter, so uh, we've left that. Uh, we do do work with rye. A lot of people get excited about it because it gets real tall. It'll tower probably 16, 18 inches over a triticale crop. But the interesting piece is 50 pounds of nitrogen in a trill, and the rye is flat on the ground. 200 pounds of nitrogen, and the rye is still standing. I mean, the triticale, I mean, is still standing. It has excellent standability. So in an organic system, when we're feeding it with manure and nitrogen, we put extra on, we don't have to worry about trying to come in and mow this because the stuff is going to stand. And then work that Dr. Ketterings did across New York State here, where they were looking at different rates of fertilizer because we can't figure out how much manure to put on until we figure out what our nitrogens are. So that's why a lot of my work, I jump from one foot to the other. We may do it in a traditional style, but then we don't go over and make the calculations to do it in an organic style. But the bottom line is on all these studies, when she took the optimum nitrogen rate, uh, this was the average, this was the yields of rye, this was the yields of wheat, and this is the yields of winter triticale. Winter triticale is the forage that we have done most of our work on because it's the better feed. For 15 years, I have worked with a breeding program and tested in New York State at the Cornell Palatial Research Farm varieties of triticale for New York conditions. So we have an excellent database that we're working from. So winter triticale is the one that I'm going to spend most of my time talking about. Growing it, probably the biggest thing we discovered on this is when we were told that winter triticale will not overwinter in our area. Well, it turns out uh, that is not true. Uh, we would grow it right up against the Canadian border north of Canton. Uh, right now we have a trial right in at Canton. And we were losing triticale until I talked to the guy planting it. I said, how deep are you planting it? He said about a half inch. He went to an inch and a quarter deep, and he had no problem with it overwintering. It's critical you get it in the ground. And the later you plant into the fall, the more important that is to get it into the ground far enough. You need to have it in so it doesn't heave out. If you plant it shallow, this is what you get. In the springtime, those plants are heaved up about a half inch. That's all it takes. And then the, uh, the wind and air dries the roots, and the plant just sits there and doesn't grow. And they say, oh, this isn't winter hardy. When, in fact, we actually had a hardware problem. We had a loose nut at the steering wheel of the tractor, did not get the seed in the ground enough. So you, you've got to fix that hardware. But where we plant it correctly, we have the growth in the fall and in the spring uh, to give you a crop each year. I uh, had a classic two years ago, either side of a fence, a very large farm planted a whole bunch of theirs about a half inch deep. On the other side of the fence, the old timer, uh, who had never forgotten how to grow grains, small grains, planted his at the correct depth. This was right up near the Canadian border. The old farmer's grain came through fine, the triticale, the triticale on the other side of the fence planted shallow all died. So depth is very critical. You have to plant this right. 
Now, when we were growing this, uh, I used to get really frustrated because we were getting about two tons of dry matter per acre in the springtime, which isn't a bad yield for a feed of this quality. But down in Pennsylvania, they were getting five and six tons of dry matter per acre. And that sort of got me. I mean, if they can do it, why couldn't we? And we started looking into it. I was planting it around wheat time, which is around September 20th here. We found if we moved our planting date up, as our planting date went up, our yields went up. And you can see that pretty much here. This is planted the first week in September. This is the second week in September. This is the third week in September when wheat normally is planted. This is the fourth week in September. And this is the first week in October. If you're in an organic system, which one of those lets more of the weeds come up? Right here, you start looking at these, these, and these, you're going to have space there for the sun to let the weeds come up. But the other piece is, is you're growing a solar collector. Which one is the better solar collector? And then finally, you need a certain number of heat units from the time you plant it until it shuts down for the winter before it starts tillering. The more heat units you have, the more tillers you have. The more tillers you have, the more yield you have the next spring. So it directly drives yield. This has been a huge uh, awakening for us. Yes? Um, banking up just a little bit, you talked about an inch and a quarter being optimal for a critical, critical mm -hmm. planting that would that hold true for the other winter grains as well? Uh, he said, uh, Triticale wants a planting depth of an inch and a quarter. Um, rye has a little bit bigger a window. You can go a little shallower on it. Uh, but I haven't sat down and saw what it did to the yield the next year, because rye can heave out also. Rye is less sensitive than triticale is. Uh, I believe wheat is even more sensitive. So uh, it depends some on the grain. But the point is, is we want to get it in the ground so it's rooted good and can overwinter. Well, good point. This is what happens when you stick it in late. Uh, this one in late, there is weeds all over the place. We have these little wintry plants and all kinds of weeds are growing in it. And this guy wasn't an organic farm, but he wasn't going to put a herbicide down anyway, because I could barely walk across that ground. It was, it was like jello. It was so soft and soupy that he got a really poor yield out of it. The point being is you need to come in and get it in on time. You get it in on time, no weeds will keep up with that. I did some work, and I'll talk about it a little later, with red clover, seeding red clover in it. I planted it early enough, I smothered red clover, which is really tough to do. But that's the kind of aggressive growth that it puts on if it has temperature behind it. Now, the other part that we learned is that nitrogen is critical for yield in the springtime. And we were trying to figure out how much nitrogen. So Dr. Kettering did a whole bunch of studies across New York State, and I had told her it's about 100 pounds of nitrogen is what we need in the spring. And lo and behold, there's a whole bunch here that are at 100 pounds of nitrogen. But all of you in this room want to look at this section right here. This caught my eye. Optimum yield was at zero pounds of nitrogen. Uh, this one here was so poor it didn't have much at all with the wheat stand. But here we have three tons of dry matter with zero pounds of nitrogen in the spring. How can we pull that off? I said, that is exactly what I want to figure out because that allows us to move it right into an organic system. And as we've done the work we found, we think we have some of the answers. Right now, I have uh, over a thousand plots in the ground across New York State looking at this. Last year we had 900 plots across New York State looking at this. We're starting to close in on it now. And what we think the answer is has to do with planting date and fall nitrogen. There's an interaction between the two which affects how much nitrogen you need in the spring. We planted the 30th of September. This is under a farm viability uh, grant that we had, which has been a real help for us. Uh, can't say enough about the folks. But uh, we planted this the 30th of September, which is about 10 days late for wheat in our area. And we only picked up about 20 pounds of nitrogen, regardless of how much was there 
in the soil for the plant to use. As we moved it back to September uh, 20th, which is our wheat planting date, we were picking up 60, maybe 70 pounds of nitrogen in this trial. When I moved it back to August 25th, which is a whole lot earlier, we were picking up 140 pounds of nitrogen in the fall in the plant. That's what I meant by a green manure storage. You can put your manure out before you plant, and if you plant it early enough, you can pick up that nitrogen and store it in living tissue so it's there for the crop for the next year. So you can make that change, and that's something that we are closing in on and getting, trying to develop really solid recommendations. Uh, as we go earlier, we also increase the yields. Unfortunately, my work is done just like you guys and gals farm. Things don't always work right. Uh, this trial had a beautiful stand going into the winter. Anybody rotationally grazing could have grazed that in the fall and pulled off phenomenal feed. We had two tons of dry matter out there. A good feed is what, 60 NDF digestibility? This was 83. 160 is a good relative feed value. This was 263. So grazing that in the fall, as long as you don't graze it less than three and a half inches, which means you need a front and back wire, you can get some phenomenal feed in November. Yes? Well, what was the planting rate? The planting rate? Uh, that was 100 pounds of the acre. That's what I've been using. Uh, a lot of guys will use 120. Somewhere's in there. I'm cheap. I don't like to spend money. <laughs> so I use 100 pounds an acre. I'd rather put 100 pounds an acre and plant it earlier than a whole lot of money later. And I did do an exact study of that. I planted it real late with a higher seeding rate. And you might as well take your significant other out to dinner and be more productive than throwing money to the seed guy because you're not going to get any yield. Uh, how does elevation affect the planting dates? Elevation will affect it just like moving north will affect it. As you go to higher elevation, you're going to have to move your planting dates up. And when I'm giving you dates now, I'm talking a low elevation just south of Albany, New York. We're about 200 feet above sea level. Uh, and there we're looking at the 10th of September as our ideal. When you get up to Minor Institute, there we're looking at September 1st as our ideal. So you have to make adjustments. Yeah. 2,300 feet. What would you say planting date would that uh, be? When is your normal uh, frost? How early in the fall? Uh, first of September. First week in September. And you're located where? We're in uh, we're in the southern tier, mm -hmm. Steuben County. It's in uh, Rexville. We're okay. 11 okay. miles off the PA line. Right. But you're real high elevation. 2300. So then I would look, instead of September 10th, I would look at uh, September, closer to September 1st, September 1st. as your time. Uh, just eyeballing it now. We haven't got enough data now, sets. Even a little earlier would be okay, the end of August? Yes, end of August would be good, yes. Because then you're going to get more time to pick up the nitrogen from the manure you put on so you can don't have to buy fertilizer in the spring to put on or put manure on. You okay. have to get the manure into the crop. Thank you. Uh, the other thing I want to caution you on, if you think you're going to come into this crop in the spring, and that's why this is so important for an organic farm, we're pretty sure the farmer won't admit this because I think he realized he royally screwed up. I think we have a farm that went and came in in the springtime after it greened up and spread liquid manure on the triticale. They mowed it all off, highly digestible, very high sugar in it. They put it into the silo, covered it up nice. They went to feed it. They opened the bunk up, they scooped into it, and the entire pile came down with a whoosh. It was a slimy, maggot-filled, infested mess. It was basically rotlich, is what he had there, because he took a highly sugar, a highly digestible forage, put manure with it, and then they went and harvested the whole thing and put it into their storage. So if anybody has the idea they're going to put manure on, unless you have something to inject it in the ground and not get it on the vegetation, I highly suggest you don't go down that road. It's something you don't need. 
What about chicken litter? Chicken litter I would put in the same uh, ballpark. Uh, we haven't done enough because what I'm worried about is if your mower is down low and then you do a good job raking it or tedding it up, you can mix chicken manure in it and you could be in the same ball of wax, which is why I'm coming back to this, this early planting date for organic systems with the manure on in the fall, uh, especially if you're coming in after a sod, you may be able to meet all your nitrogen needs. Unfortunately, that research is ongoing right now. I don't have the final answer. We were discussing about running the statistics on this on the one I was driving out. If you put it in early and then try to raise it, say, early November, mm -hmm. um, is it still going to be a viable crop in the spring? Uh, that's part of my research because I put it in early this year. I came in with my plot harvester and I harvested it off. and left about a three and a half inch stubble. We have a plot out right near, uh, just over the hill from Buffalo. Uh, and I have a couple plots uh, in the other end of the state over by Albany, and we're trying to figure, figure that out. Because we are removing some nitrogen at that point, and we don't know what it does then to the whole fertility status. So we're starting, we're figuring it out. The point is, is it has a huge potential for organic farms. That's why I wanted to tell you about it. But I will tell you right up front, we don't know all the answers yet. We are in the middle of doing the work. So you're getting some real cutting edge stuff uh, at this point. The other thing that comes into play and where manure in the fall works well is I put a pile of nitrogen, 115 pounds of nitrogen on in the springtime, and I got 12% crude protein. I used ammonium sulfate, which has sulfur in it, and I've got 71% <coughs> crude protein. One of the best sources of sulfur on an organic farm is manure. So you put your manure on in the fall, the sulfur is going to get taken up along with the nitrogen and stored into the, in the plant, so then in the springtime uh, you have stuff there to grow the protein that you need to get the milk out of the cows. Now some of the guys uh, give me a hard time, they say, well, you're trying to reduce my corn. If I, if I shorten up my corn to plant your triticale earlier, I'm going to take a yield hit. Well, technically, yes, there is a slight yield reduction over time. But the other thing that happens, if we go from a long season corn to a shorter season corn and then put a winter forage in there, we end up with more yield, 25 to 35% more yield than if we grew a long season corn. But you have a whole lot less risk because you're not out there trying to get this crop out of the mud in the fall. Do you have any plans? I'm doing uh, test plots for us that leave corn on for grain. Take Pardon me? Do you have any plans to do test plots for us that grow corn for grain? Take it off later in the season? Uh, cropping like you're doing now? If you're grass. going to be doing this, there's two pieces. First, if you're growing corn grain, there's two options for you. One uh, is to go to a shorter season corn because the shorter season corns you raise the population, you're not looking at, don't worry about the decrease in digestibility of stock, it's immaterial, you're just after the corn. So we, I, I planted short season corns at high populations and got really good yields out of it. Uh, the second part of that is, you may want to hear this, but then, then you may, is we are seriously looking at this crop as a grain source instead of corn. Combining it off in July because we don't have to cultivate it. If we plant our triticale right, we don't have to cultivate it. And then we can combine it off in July and get a grain crop. And there's a whole bunch of permutations on that with legumes and everything else we are just getting into now. But we feel it has a real good potential because of the high energy of this crop and a really good yield. And it's at a lower cost than corn. So we're looking at some Part. So there's two answers there for you. Have you used Presto, the old variety of triticale and Presto? Uh, Presto we used a number of years ago. Uh, I haven't used it recently. It's a good variety. Uh, mostly one of the ones that we have really liked is uh, 336. Uh, that one has done really well with grain. 815 is actually a better grain <coughs> color, but last year 336 beat the pants off of it. We don't know why. Uh, but there are good ones out there. All the varieties I have in right now, we have 30 varieties in. 
They're here for grain uh, forage and they're here for grain right next to each other. So we, we check for grain yields on a regular basis. Yes. Are any of those varieties organic? Uh, there is a number of them that are sold organically, yes. I believe both Seedway and I'm, I'm pretty positive uh, King's Agri Seed has organic uh, varieties for you. They don't have that. It's either <laughs> no, I, I thought they had him, yeah. So uh, he's the guy if you go uh, to the talk, you better keep going. Oh, that's all right, I should, yeah. All right, now, the other piece that comes into this is, okay, what if I'm not growing grain? What if I'm not growing corn? I know you're not a real farmer if you don't grow corn. Well, it turns out there's some other energy crops out here that fit an organic system a whole heck of a lot better with a whole lot less work cultivating, unless you enjoy cultivating. What we are looking at doing is uh, in the springtime putting manure on and planting our annual. Uh, it can be a shorter season corn uh, or uh, rod is the 82 day Master's Choice in Organic also? Yeah. It is? That's a really good one if you're going to grow a short season corn with this in New York. It's a flowery. Uh, but the other is to grow uh, a sorghum species in here for the summertime. And then you take it off around the beginning, in this case, depending on your elevation, etc. You chop it off and then you put manure on and plant your triticale and you just keep flipping it over and over again. It's a real slick system. <coughs> when you look at the brown midrib sorghums, especially if you're going with a grass fed so you're taking a pre-grain fill, you have the same total energy, you just have it coming from a different source. It's mostly sugars and digestible fiber. And you have to manage it to protect that sugar. And we'll talk about that more in a minute. Now the sorghums, uh, the BMR6s is what we recommend. There are BMR12s and BMR18s. Uh, their uh, alleles are sisters of each other. And Dr. Grant's work found that they are not as good in milk production as the BMR6. And all of those are far better than the straight BMR sorghums that have, uh, straight sorghums that have, don't have the BMR gene. The BMR gene is not a genetically modified crop. It's not a GMO. It was developed way back in the 50s, probably before half this room was even born. Uh, so it's not as genetically modified. It gives you high fiber digestibility. They built up yields under a range of conditions. We're going to talk about the harvest window. We have a much bigger harvest window than we ever thought. It doesn't get most of the corn, insects, and diseases. Ironically, the traditional farmers are looking at this crop because of the problems they're having with this GMO control of rootworms that they're looking at planting a sorghum crop because they can grow two years of corn after that with no rootworms. Sorghum species will wipe out every rootworm in your field. So it is a way that you can control them if you are doing corn. Uh, we can plant it with a drill to get less weed pressure and there are now shorter varieties available. Uh, it's a C4 plant just like corn is. Uh, it's not a C3, but it likes warm weather. So if you're at 2,500 foot elevation in Stubbent County, uh, I would test it before I went down wild with it uh, because it doesn't like cool temperatures. But you may be warm enough there to not have any problem. Uh, we get it up in upper Minnesota, it gets to be questionable. Uh, they are testing it at Thunder Bay. Dr. Carlock is testing it at Thunder Bay Research Center, which if you look at a map of U.S. and there's this bulge where Lake Superior sticks up, and in Lake Superior there's another little bulge, that's where Thunder Bay is, and that's where they are testing it uh, now, and it's doing pretty decent under those cool conditions. Uh, growing degree days there are like 16 to 1800, if that would help. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he would be shorter than that and cooler summer day daytime temperatures. That's the daytime temperatures is what we're looking at. Uh, but you do have some other advantages you're going to see when it comes to harvest time. We saw this in 2012, and this is back in uh, the early 90s uh, when I took this picture. Uh, we had a real dry year. 
Uh, we had 11 and a half tons of sorghum. We had five tons of silage from the corn. You get twice the yield of a sorghum species when it turns dry than you do from corn. So when it turns dry, this is the crop to have. You don't grow all one crop, you spread your risk out. Now, there's three different types here. There's a sorghum, forage sorghum, not talking grain sorghum. We're looking at grain sorghum for the gluten-free market, but that's a whole other story. Um, sorghum for a one cut, a sorghum sedan, we can take a one or multi-cut, and sedan grass where we take a one or a multi-cut. This is the old BMR forage sorghum. And unless you're in a grass-fed operation where you can't let any of the heads spill out, I would not grow this, because I've gotten 26, 28 tons to the acre, and the entire crop was as high as the table. It was all a large mess. This is a new brachytic dwarfs. What they are are short and fat. And now somebody will say, well, why do I want to grow a stunted plant? It's not stunted, it's a dwarf. It's like a seven foot tall basketball player and a six foot tall football <coughs> linebacker. The six foot tall football linebacker is going to outweigh the basketball player. And that's what we have with these brachytic dwarfs. They're short, stocky plants. Uh, you can see the traditional in the middle and then the brachytic dwarfs on either side. They put out a heck of a size stem. The downside on the sorghums and why I am not <coughs> suggesting them at this time, the one cuts brachytic dwarf sorghums for an organic operation is because they take a long time to get out of the ground. Uh, I planted mine and uh, uh, two years ago and it was 10 days to two weeks before I saw plants. I planted the non brachytic dwarfs, they were up in three yeah. days. Uh, this year we planted them with a better drill and we planted them shallower, three quarters of an inch. It still took a week before they were out of the ground, which means you're going to be dealing with weeds. We have a better alternative right now that you can use. And that is using a sorghum sedan or a sedan grass, planting them in narrow rows. They get out of the ground. Uh, literally, I had mine out of the ground on the third day after planting. And we found as we increase the seeding rate, this is the seeding rate a lot of the people recommend. But by increasing the seeding rate, we decrease the percentage of that yield is weeds. Dr. Understander in Wisconsin and I had to go back and forth because he was recommending a lower seeding rate. He said, I didn't see any yield increase going with a higher seeding rate. I said, I didn't either, but I saw less weeds. And in an organic system, less weeds is very important. Here is a low seeding rate. You can see the weeds popping up in it. Here is the higher seeding rates. And the more we get that ground packed in here with vegetation, the less weeds are going to grow. Anything less than 60% incident light, annual grasses cannot grow. If you plant your sorghum sedan and you plant it into lousy conditions, you do a lousy job planting it, and it sits there for a while and annual grasses come up, your best move is to plow it up and start over because it's not going to compete with annual grasses if they come up at the same time. If it comes up before them, it will kick butt on all the weeds. Uh, here is some Paul Saracoletti up in Delaware had some. Uh, this is where he missed with the drill. This had no weeds in it. Uh, this was a solid stand of velvet leaf that was coming up uh, in the crop. It's a very good smother crop. If it's drilled in narrow rows, it's drilled properly. Properly is the word. You know, we plant corn, everybody likes to get the newest corn planter because they know it does a good job. But when it comes to drilling, they get out some old Van Brunt that uh, Grandpa had, and that's what they're still using to plant with. When in fact there is better technology out there. We switched, and you're going to see my old drill, because all the stuff I have in the research farm is 1960s era <coughs> equipment. But uh, I have got an organic farmer nearby who lets me uh, use his equipment. Uh, I pay him for it. But uh, we read his equipment from him, and it made a huge difference coming in with a good drill. The sorghums, we only plant six to seven pounds of seed to the acre at three quarters of an inch deep. If you don't have good depth control, it's not going to work. If you're going with sorghum sedans or sedan grasses, planting them shallower like that gets them out of the ground in three days. But you need a drill that has good depth control and a press wheel right behind it. You leave it loose in between where the weeds are growing and you press right where the seed is going. That's going to give you optimum growth. You try to do it without and you have something like this. 
this is not a uniform sand, this is a mess, and that's what the old drills do. Now, I am a big proponent of narrow rows, partly because of yield. We are seeing a yield increase. Though in this trial it was numerically more, but uh, uh, statistically it wasn't because I had variability in the field. But the other piece is just plain practical. Here is sorghum sedan on 30 inch rows. Yes, you can grow it on 30 inch rows. Yes, you're going to have to cultivate to keep the weeds out. See, they're starting to pop up in there already, and there's a couple of them down through here. If we take that same crop and we use a drill and we plant it in narrow rows, this was planted the same day. And you look at the shading we have going on there, weeds cannot compete with that. And so you use this as a smother crop. It can give you a big advantage in controlling weeds in an organic system. Here is corn. A month after planting it, you see all that bare ground. Well, if there's bare ground there, A, it's eroding, B, the soil is breaking the structure down, and C, weeds are growing in here, unless you're out there on a regular basis with the cultivator. Here is BMR sorghum sedan drill. In this case, it was six inch rows. Uh, in two to three weeks, you are not going to see any ground whatsoever. And what it is, it gets up, it's an inch tall one week, it's two inches tall the next week, it's four inches tall the week after that, it's eight inches tall the week after that, it's 16 inches tall the week after that. It literally doubles its size each week. And that's the kind of aggressive growth we need to keep the ground shaded. So I want to look real quick at the, this is the Prakitic Dwarf Sorghum Sedan. This is a sedan grass, these are all BMR, ground midriffs. Uh, this is not BMR. There is a BMR pearl millet available, uh, but this is not a BMR uh, pearl millet that we were growing. Uh, the pearl millet I'm very interested in for grazing, and it also works well if you have a short growing season and you want very high quality forage. It doesn't give us a lot of it, but it gives us very high quality forage. It tends to be a shorter season, so it's heading out sooner. Here is the BMR sorghum sedan. Uh, we got around 16 tons to the acre out of the two cuts off of that one. Uh, next to it, this dwarf, rachitic dwarf sorghum sedan, which is a short, stocky plant, did not look impressive. I'm thinking, boy, this is going to kick butt on this crop. Wrong. This had already headed out. We got 16 tons to the acre. This, we got 19 tons to the acre out of it because it had a longer season to grow before it was heading out, giving us more yield, which is a real important piece that we'll come back to again. But you can grow these crops in a solid wall like this and keep the weeds out. So it fits an organic system very well. The new sedan grasses, if you're doing multi-cut, and I'm going to talk about multi-cut in a minute, but if you're doing a multi-cut, the new sedan grasses that are out, the BMR sedan grasses, regrow a whole lot faster than the sorghum sedans. So if you're doing a multi-cut, you may want to look at using the sedan grasses. Sedan grasses also normally do not have much, if any, prussic acid. They won't say no prussic acid because they've done so many back crosses that they never know what is in the crop for sure. So to cover their butt, they say it will have a little bit of uh, prussic acid in it, but it's not as bad as a sorghum or a sorghum sedan. Now, the part that caught my attention when we were doing this work, and again, this is a, I'm showing you cutting edge stuff that we don't have all the answers to yet, but we are working on. My original thought was if I catch this at boot stage, like the cool season grasses, that's ideal. Same way with triticale. You catch it at boot stage, that's ideal. Well, it turns out that is not true because here is this variety at boot stage and at 56 for uh, the NDFDs. When we got it to where it was headed out, it was up to 70. Digestibility kept increasing as the head came out, which violates all the rules, right? Well, I like violating rules. I must have been hell as a kid from my parents, but I like violating rules. This violates the rules. Yes. Does the protein go down as the head comes off? Uh, protein goes uh, down. Here is protein 9.4. Here it is 7.9. And the answer is yes. Your protein will go down as the head comes up further. 
as it grows bigger and bigger, the protein will go down. So it depends on where you want your protein. But if you're growing this in com combination with a winter triticale, you're pulling off 16 to 18, 20 percent protein off of that and still uh, getting a good energy crop. So you put the two of them together, you're fine. And you're going to see another crop in here that can be a better protein source than either of those. So, Tom, what are you showing with that graph? What I'm showing here is that as of that boot stage, the energy, the digestibility, the NDFD digestibility is not as high at boot stage as it is when it's first heading out. But, but which crop is that? Uh, this one happened to be an 83-day sorghum uh, where we had done this work with. We saw similar data. I didn't show it. We have similar data with the, the sorghum sedans. This is a sorghum sedan at boot stage. It's a higher digestible crop right there. And we're still playing around with the optimums. I have a grant in for this year if Farm Viability funds it, where we're going to take the sorghum, and I'll probably take a sorghum sedan, and harvest it from boot stage on up through soft dough, harvesting it each week so that we can determine what is optimum yet. We're working on it. So if you were looking at the acreage production, that would even be more uh, a bigger difference because you're also growing dry matter. Yes, your yield is going up. Uh, your yield is going up uh, significantly, and you'll, you'll see that in a minute. Exactly the point that I wanted to make. And here it is, that data right there. Uh, this is Sargon Sinan. Well, no, this is a different point I want to make. I'm sorry, my mistake. My bad. Um, this is narrow row versus wide row. You can see 19 tons of the acre versus 17. By putting those plants spread out more, we're getting more yield. The piece that we knew from way back, now this is sorghum sedan. As the yield goes up, this is milk production per pounds per acre. If this was a poor quality, you know, if this was a poor quality feed, then this number, this would have curved a lot flatter in here. But the line is almost straight, which means it is a good quality feed right up through it heading out. So we have a bigger harvest window. And as it keeps growing, we keep getting more yield. And that was a piece that we learned way back when I was doing this in the 90s, is if we cut it and we get this crop here, yes, you have something, a bird in hands worth two in the bush. So we have a, definitely have a crop in storage. But then growth is slowed down because it has to regrow all the leaves. And so it starts growing slow, and then it picks up speed. Whereas if we let that factory just keep right on growing, it will add a whole lot more yield, taking it as a one cut instead of a two cut. And I know it's on your mind, okay, one cut of 17 tons of the acre of wet stuff, how are you going to get it dry? Well, we're going to look at that. That was something, and again, this is more cutting edge stuff. We are in the middle of the research on all this. But it's very apropos for your farms. That's why I wanted to at least let you be aware of this. This was a prachytic dwarf that we came in. It was just pollinated, 16% dry matter. And we were direct chopping it with a colossal chopper. The interesting piece is we had perfect fermentation with it. See, what we've learned is you know how a hotel is laid out and they have all these rooms going down the hallway? Well, each of those rooms can be a plant cell. And there's all these plant cells, just like rooms in the hotel and this is the hallway. Every time we cut one of those rooms, we let the stuff leak out. The sugar comes out, the protein comes out. The more cells or rooms are cut, the doors are open, the more liquid comes running out. So you go and chop this stuff real fine, you are going to have a lake of water, or actually it's sugar water, coming off of your silo, out of your bags, out of your uh, uh, ag bags. We don't want that. The more it's broken up, the more sugar is released. The other piece we've learned is we have run into a couple of farms where they have grown this. They've chopped it up, they put a homolactic bacteria on like they were supposed to, they get real good fermentation, and then when they start feeding it out, they couldn't keep ahead of the spoilage. Well, what was happening is we were cutting so many of these cells, we had so much liquid running out of the plant, 
we had all this liquid running out. We put the homolactic bacterium on, it uses it to ferment it perfectly, but it doesn't use all the sugar off. And then as soon as you open it up and start to feed it out, there's just sugar <coughs> laying there with liquid, and every bug and organism floating in the air is going to glom onto that and start getting secondary spoilage going. And you can't keep ahead of it. But if we don't chop all these things up, if we take and only cut every fifth or tenth door in the hotel room open, we have a whole lot less liquid. All this sugar in here is preserved. Nothing is going to break it down until it gets into the rumen and the bacteria start working on it in the rumen, which does two things. I talked to one guy who did a study with high sugar diets in dairy cows. And he said he had incredible acidosis. And I said, you took a five pound can of sugar and just poured it into the TMR, right? He said, right. This is not the same thing. This sugar is locked up in each one of these cells and it has to be broken into. And so it's a nice, slow, steady release as the rumen bacteria work on the forage. It's a light, nice, slow, steady release so it doesn't get subclinical acidosis keeps your pH high so your cow is healthy and you're getting maximum components from your milk because the pH is up. And we have less liquid so it's not running out of the silo. Doesn't it also enter the picture you're getting your energy out of sugars rather than starch? Doesn't that also enter? Yes, that does enter the picture and we had a question for uh, Randy Schaefer when he was out from the University of Wisconsin. He was doing a whole talk on low starch diets. And he nicely showed that if we took the starch out and we put soy hulls, which is an NDF uh, source in it, and balance the ration out, that we would get a decrease in milk production. So the guy sitting next to me does rations that are 80% forage and 85 pounds of milk. He's got a bunch of his clients that are doing that. And he and I were jumping out of our seats. And our question to him was, all right, instead of soy hulls, we put in a forage that is really high sugar. What happens then? He says if the NEL goes back up to where it was when we had the starch in, you're going to have the same milk production, which was a big aha for us. You can make milk on sugar just as well as you can make it on starch, and you can do it with forages. But the guy has to know what he's doing. That's they the have, and I'm going to get that is key. You can lose that sugar real easy. The problem usually, we can frame the problem. Just take a frame and put it around a mirror and hang it up in your barn. <clears throat> and then you'll know where the problem is if you don't have the sugar in there. <laughs> yes, you. Uh, when we pulled into our triticale one year, the average of my 30 varieties was 21% sugar. Another year we had the unusual conditions of very sunny days and very cold nights. Down to 30, they said they could not use my data. Nobody's going to believe triticale is 26% sugar. You could taste it on your hands. It was so sticky. There was a question in the back there. Going back to your comment earlier about, I think it was, was it winter trick how you said you made silage out of and it, it ended up being a slimy nut? <coughs> that was where they had manure on it. Okay. So the manure caused the problem. The manure would cause the problem because his neighbor did the same thing, didn't put manure on his, and he had perfect feed, which really takes the farmer off even more than that. <laughs> no, we just took a whole bunch of biological soup inoculant from a cow's digestive tract, manure, spread it on highly digestible forage, and then chop all that forage up to release the sugar so that all the organisms in the manure can start working on the sugar. They inoculated theirs with manure. Wrong. Wrong. How do you test the sugar? Is that with a refractometer or is that all a lab test? I'm playing around with a refractometer, but a normal forage analysis will tell you what the sugar is. And that, which is better? Uh, the forage analysis is going to be more accurate than the refractometer. The refractometer goes up and down quite a bit. Uh, I'm playing around with one of those, but it's um, a normal forage analysis will tell you. Uh, they usually they used to say that anything over two percent sugar is considered unusual. Um, my triticale samples have run over ten percent after fermentation. My sorghum last year or year before after fermentation was running eight percent sugar. These are numbers they are just not used to seeing, but they're numbers that fit in a high forage diet. And the other piece that happened 
is with the triticale, one of the farmers was feeding it, and he got nervous. He said every time the mixer wagon showed up, he said the cows jumped up out of the beds and come running over because they wanted the high sugar forage. I gotta watch my time here. Okay, we have all this high moisture fermentation. So the longer you make the cut, the less loss in fermentation. Uh, the longer cut is less leachate. You want to use a homolactic bacteria. There is a number of organic homolactic bacteria available. You want to use one of those. The idea uh, that you're just going to toss it out there and let it ferment on its own is crazy. It's like taking you know, a field and it's just been junk for years, so we're going to toss the cows out there and whatever grows is fine. Well, no, you plant the right crops because you know you're going to get a response. You need to use the right bacteria. With that much sugar there, you have to steer and control that fermentation or you could have any sort of problems afterwards. We get perfect fermentation, 16 to 18% moisture level. Had one guy chop the stuff at boot stage, put a homolactic bacteria on it. He said in 24 hours, the pile was cold. He put it into his diet, replacing 30% of the corn silage. The cows never missed a beat. My own work uh, last year, 16 to 18% is what our trials were. It was on Wednesday, we chopped it. I put a homolactic bacteria on it, put it into mini silos. We opened it up on Friday, and the pile had already picked it. That's the kind of fermentation you get. You do have to haul more water, just right up front. And if you're going to mow this, you put it in the same day you mow it. Do not leave it sit overnight, or you are going to have a clostridia, butyric, rotlage mess. It does not work if you leave it overnight. So what kind of rate are you putting the nitrogen on? Yeah. Uh, just look at the label. We use just labeled rates is what we're doing. Yeah. How tall a silo did you try it in? Pardon me? How tall a silo did you try it in? How tall of a silo do we try to? Yeah. My silos are all mini silos. I don't have big silos. Yes, you do worry about the leachate coming out. But I talked to a guy last year, and he said he cut his an inch and a quarter long, put it in an upright silo, and he didn't have that much juice in because you're not breaking all the cells. That's the key, not to break all the cells, not to make a mess out of it. In an ag bag where the presses are, make sure they're square. If they're not square, what it is, it's like a fork on potatoes. You know, you mash potatoes. That's what an ag bagger will do. It will make mush out of this and you'll have juice all over. You get the same effect if you're round reeling with a road cut baler? Uh, yes, because you'll have the long length of cut. I really like taking these crops and running them through a round bale with a rotor cut. And I'm actually, I have some other stuff on that. Uh, I might cover later, but I don't know if I have time. What time do I go for? I have 10 minutes, right? Five minutes. Okay. Well, okay. All right, I might be able to cover some of that at the end. He never told me how long I had, which is really dangerous. <laughs> you <laughs> never do that. <laughs> this is a tough group to manage. We usually don't you know, hold it too tight. Mm -hmm. Okay. Good. All right, you want to put it in the silo, and you want to wrap it the same day you're mowing it. This is highly digestible stuff. It turns into compost quickly if you leave it sit overnight. And Dr. Lyman Kuhn did that. He took fresh alfalfa, cut it, put it right into a silo, and fermented perfectly. And he was trying to make clostridium butyric. He said, I felt like a fool. I'm an expert in it, and I couldn't make it. So I said, leave it overnight. He left it overnight. He had clostridium and butyric up the wazoo. So it's all up to you what kind of feed you have. You need to get it in the same day you mow it. Uh, Dr. Grant up at Minor Institute, when he was at, uh, when he first started up there, uh, we had him do um, a feed <coughs> trial with, uh, this is sorghum sedan, and they had the same milk production, 35 <coughs> BMR 45, and then they had corn silage in here. These are both high forage diets. They had no difference in 3.5% fat corrected milk, but they had the same, they had higher rooming pHs where they were feeding the sorghum sedan versus feeding corn. A big warning on this. There's a lot of NIR analysis out there, and I had two people here back in January, a meeting I did on sorghum, come up to me with samples that showed it was just a mediocre energy grass, and this is the reason why. 
NIR is usually about 0.13 points below what the real feed value is. The cows will milk on it a whole lot better. And that's what happened here. Um, uh, Paul Saracoletti took some samples, sent them in as NIR, and sent them in for the true NL, uh, big vitro adjusted NEL. This is the same as corn silage. This is the same as a mediocre grass, simply because of the forage analysis. This is what the feed really is. NIR. NIR is where they take a sample and uh, they run it, they burn it, and looking at the um, uh, production of different wavelengths, they can tell, they have a whole calibration, tells what uh, the value of that is, and they run it through a formula. Uh, the in vitro is where they take rumen fluid and they put it into a dish, and they actually let it uh, digest itself over time, and it gives a much better analysis. Uh, what we're hoping to do this year is the new TT, NDFD, whatever it is that Dr. Coombs has, the total track uh, digestibility of NDF. Uh, we're looking at one of these through that. We think that's going to be a much better analysis. Yeah, so there's a question back there. Is the in vitro better, you say? The in vitro analysis is better, yes. That's what you want to use. What's the top number of inches? Oh, that's just how tall the crop was. So you need to get all your nitrogen on at once. But two pieces I've talked about so far come into play. I talked about the nitrogen from manure, and I talked about taking one cut instead of a multi-cut system. And when we do that, this happens to be a one cut, but was with uh, the sorghum. I found, I've done several trials of sorghum, and it's sorghum sedans, but recently sorghum at the Malaysia Research Farm. I can't do nitrogen trials there anymore. And the reason being is right here. 26 tons to the 25, 26 tons of the acre at 50 pounds of nitrogen. That's because I rotate on a regular basis. It's because I've been building organic matter, moving my crops around. We've increased our tillage depth using deep zone tillage before we plant our triticale, before we plant our seedings, and the roots are now going down deeper, and a sorghum plant will go down and find those uh, nutrients that have leached out past and pull it back. And so I basically can't do a nitrogen trial there anymore because I build up the background organic matter so much. If you're coming in after a sod, and I'm going to show you some short rotations for sod, you're not going to need any additional nitrogen because it's going to be there. It's going to be there. If you're putting manure on and incorporating it, all, half of that manure is slow-release nitrogen. And so that can also meet your needs. Now, at Cornell, where they did it, they could do real nice trials, get a nice nitrogen response. Why? They haven't been able to rotate. They don't add manures. They haven't been doing the detail. It's just you know, plot of this and plot of that. They just don't have that extra piece going in that everybody in this room understands is critical for soil health, rotating your crops and building organic matter. Now, the other part that's really nice about this sorghum sedan and sedan grasses is it's flexible. It's not just one size fits all. If you want to let it grow up and then harvest it, round bale wrap it, use it for your storage, that's fine. If you don't want to, you can graze it. You can rotationally graze it. You need a front wire and back wire, but this is a phenomenal energy source that you don't have to do any work for other than moving the wire right through the summer. And as long as you leave a six inch regrowth point, it will regrow at a phenomenal rate, coming right back and supplying more feed, and you can regraze that uh, during the summer. Now, when we team it up with triticale, a two-cut system yields a little less than a one-cut system, but you put those pieces together with a nice triticale yield underneath. Remember, we got a big harvest we need now. So you can get your triticale planted on time, get that off. You don't have to rush to plant your sorghum because they like warm soil. So in the spring, normally our triticale is ready at flag leaf stage, which is when you have to harvest it, usually about uh, the 18th to 20th of May. I don't plant my sorghums to the 1st of June usually because I want to make sure the ground is warm. Last year I didn't plant it till the 10th of June because I was trying to deal with a thousand triticale samples. Uh, sort of like farming. 
So let's look at taking this and putting this into a whole farm picture. And that's the way you work. Okay, we have our, our, uh, our winter our annual, we harvest it, come in, plant, or put our manure on, plant our, our summer one, and then we come back and we put the manure on again and till plant uh, our uh, triticale. Now, one of the options I discovered doing this is that for where I am, which is uh, just south of Albany, a low warm elevation, if I get it in before September 1st, I can plant right over with it. So I have my seeding in already because I got it in early enough. If you're in a higher, cooler elevation, move to an earlier planting date and then put your clover in with it. It works really slick. But there is still another possibility I'm going to come to if you can't fit that, if it gets to be uh, too late. Yes? Do you think that would work with alfalfa? Absolutely not. Been there, done that. <laughs> part of my job is to make the mistakes so you don't have to. So he didn't tell you part of my job description is I'm a professional screw-up. <laughs> I've, I've done it and had it work. You had it work? Beautiful. Yeah. When we did you do it? Waited until 1st of April. Oh, okay. You, you're ahead of me. You got to, you're, you're letting my slide talk out. That's oh, not fair. Okay. I got a couple slides you got to wait for that. <laughs> but anyway, when I did do it with clover, um, we did try it with the drill and the tube right behind. And what that does is it drops the seed uh, right in where the triticale is in the same line. So this poor <coughs> clover plant is trying to tangle with this big, aggressive uh, triticale plant. What I found works best for me is I pull my drill and I pull a brilliant cedar behind it and the drill puts these in rows and it drops all the clover seed in between and so I have a better uniform use on my ground and this stuff helps to keep any weeds out from in between the rows. So it's a system that works very well. But again, like I said, I'm a professional screw up. We did this and I planted it early and I put too much manure on the field. I had triticale that was that high in November, and there was nothing growing underneath it. There was no clover whatsoever. I completely wiped it out. So it's something you do have to watch out for. But if it does wipe it out, you have another option. Uh, somebody spoiled my talk earlier. <laughs> You do have an option of coming in, especially with clover and frost seeding. That's old, old technology. But I will go you one better on your idea. Uh, and that is, uh, I'll show right at the end, there's another seeding method that we're going to come up with that you may be very interested in. But so far I've been talking about red clover. Um, I did work with a very nice farmer. Um, very mild-mannered person, and we were at his farm, he has hill country, wet soils, and I said, um, you know, one of the things I'm looking at is I think what would work really good on your Burdette Nunde soils, <coughs> because they're fragile pans, they're wet, I said, is to grow some clover. The guy came across the table and tried to punch me in the mouth, he was that <laughs> mad. He said, don't you ever have me grow that wet slop again. My grandfather grew it, and I will not grow it. Well, turns out that is not true. So you have to stay awake another five minutes and you're going to find out that you can grow red clover and you can get it harvested the same day you mow it. And one of the reasons we're looking at clover is it has feed value equal or exceeding alfalfa. It has an enzyme that inhibits protein breakdown, so we have more bypass protein. You know, some of the traditional ones, they throw in things like feather meal and the like into it because they know they get a milk production increase from the bypass protein. You don't need it. You've got it here. We're going to be testing this year. We think it actually cut at the same day. The digestibility of clover is higher than the digestibility of alfalfa. And then finally, there's another organism that only exists in clover <coughs> and in hops. When you put it in the room and it stops a bacteria that rips apart the protein, uses that energy and dumps soluble protein into the rumen, which isn't as efficiently used by the cow, and this inhibits it. So we have a whole bunch of pieces in clover actually make it a better feed than alfalfa. 
alfalfa salesman will probably burn my car or something, but <laughs> that's the way it goes. Slash your tires. <laughs> yeah, slash my tires. Well, uh, we used to joke when I was in extension, we did this kind of stuff all the time. We joked that uh, if they found me gunned down on some back road, they'd have a heck of a time figuring out who did it, because everybody would want to take credit for it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, red clover, a legend a day. Can you do it? Yes. Wrong slide. I think you can come over and see. I don't know where it is. I might find it later. I had a slide in here. What we found is we did a number of studies uh, two years ago. Four of the trials, three of those trials had rain the night before. The other one did not have rain the night before, but it was cloudy and overcast that had rain 24 hours before. This was second, cut, second year red clover, so that's your thickest stand. It was one tenth bloom, so you're looking at clover that's up halfway up to my thighs. We laid it out wide, more than 80% of the cutter bar width. But if you do that, when you do it with alfalfa, the leaves roll and let the sunlight hit underneath. It doesn't do that with clover. Clover, when you peel up the leaf, it's just as green underneath as like you just mowed it, right? So what you do is you lay it out wide, 80% or more of cutter bar width, give it an hour or two hours of drying, and then you come through with your tether. You come through slow. If you go fast, you're going to do two things. First, you're going to rip the tether apart, but secondly, you're going to make tether lumps, which is where the tine comes around, gathers it and packs it around the tine, and chunks this football-sized lump out the back. And from the tractor seat, it looks fine. But you've got all these lumps, they will not dry. You're talking rotary, rotary tether? A rotary tether. Okay. You need to go slow so it has time to pull it apart yeah. and spread it out. So it does a good job. Okay? Uh, if you have deflector shields on your mower to get the wide swat, take them all off. You need to let the stuff go right out the back. And I may have a, a, a picture of that in here. I'm doing, I just did three talks last night, two of them I had to send out, so I'm trying to remember which one's in which talk. <laughs> but the other piece that I wanted to, I have stuffed this slide in for. This is important on organic farms where you have to have a tight rotation. If we grow a corn or a sorghum here, all right, we have a sod field, so you don't need nitrogen. You can put a bunch of manure on. We take it off, we hit it with manure in the fall and plant our triticale, or we plant triticale with a, a clover, but in your case, uh, you may want to just plant the triticale with the manure. And then we come in and we put our frost seeded clover in, or there's another option that you'll find out in a few minutes we can use. And so we have our clover crop and our triticale crop. A lot of people don't like to seed down because seeding you, you don't get anything, right? You only get this little piddly crop. Well, we're pulling off 10 tons of silage on seeding year. Clover only lasts two years, and then the clover root curculio and the Satona weevil decimate it. Now, I'm working with Dr. Elson Shields at Cornell. He is going to be putting on the farm this year uh, a nematode study like they controlled this alfalfa snout beetle up in Canton in that area using a nematode that they spray on the field. It's a little bug that lives in the soil. Completely organic system. We're going to try that with red clover. We don't know if it works or not. Any research involving white clover? Uh, white clover tends to be a horizontal clover. I'm at this point just working with the upright reds. Yes, uh, yeah, you're about three steps ahead of me. There's a whole bunch of stuff I need to work on. So I'm not going to die because i got too much work to do. <laughs> Just ask my wife. <laughs> She's got a whole list for me. But the other point is, is OK, at the end of this year, if we plow up it and then plant corn on it, you've got a 15 to 20% yield increase because it's first year corn. Secondly, first year, you're not going to have as many weeds in your corn if you are growing corn. And thirdly, you don't need any nitrogen because you've got it all there from the clover. So using a short rotation like this can really save you a lot on both herbicides uh, and on uh, the nitrogen. How many cuttings do you think you can get off in the third year? Off the clover? Uh, we've done three with no trouble. Seeding year, I had one guy do three on seeding year. He said, because I had to get the last cutting because the deer were going to get it on me. So um, that was the only uh, part on there. 
but we don't know for clover. Uh, Dr. Undersander did this very nice study where he showed that you could do two cuttings with red clover versus three cuttings versus four, and he said two or three look better. But what we don't know is all of that was predicated on a digestibility of the clover and the energy value of the clover that in my work found had no foundation behind it. And we are actively working with Dr. Grant at Minor to figure out how can we figure out the energy level of clover. Because clover doesn't just store in sugar, it stores in pectins. And a lot of the forage analysis do not measure pectins. So there's this whole energy piece that's missing. So we've got to go back and do the basics work of figuring out when to cut this. Does cutting, when you cut clover, does that encourage root growth? Pardon me? Does, when you cut clover, does it encourage root growth? Does it encourage root growth on a clover? Anytime you cut a plant, it sets the plant back some. Certain number of roots die, but the roots do have, in clover, have storage in it that sends up new shoots, and they will continually be adding new roots all the time. So you're, you're going to be going back and forth when you're harvesting. How does that relate to stubble height? How does it relate to stubble height? Uh, you're ahead of me. I have a newsletter if anybody is interested. Unfortunately, I only sent it electronically because I have no money to do this. That I am writing, and part of it is uh, <coughs> called Minimum Till Haylage. And this mowers and mowers set down, so that makes a nice clean cut because I'm a good farmer. Ends up mixing dirt in it, and you're losing about two pounds of milk per cow by adding going from 9 to 11 percent ash in your feed. Getting that cutter bar back is going to let the clover regrow faster, and it's going to keep the dirt out of your field. I haven't found dirt yet that makes good milk. And it's a lot better on the cutter bar. You don't have to charge the knives all the time. Yes, a lot better. The other thing Fertrell brought up was the fact that he could hold a 28-day mowing rotation doing that, keeping it up. Mm -hmm. Especially first cutting, keep it higher, and then each and you, each uh, Sequential cutting, he drop it an inch or so, starting at six inches on the first cut, mm -hmm. down to four on the third or fourth. Yeah, we are just getting into management of red clover, so uh, there's a whole bunch of unanswered questions, but I can't answer them until I figure out the feed, the feed analysis. So we'll probably be doing a bunch of work on that. You'll hear a lot more about clover. Uh, this cutting is done in the p.m. Is the cutting done in the afternoon? Um, I talked about that last year. The bottom line on that is you can cut it in the afternoon, the sugars are going to be high, you leave it set overnight, it's going to respire the sugars off, it's going to increase clostridia, it's going to increase butyric, and it doesn't matter because by morning the sugars are all down in the proverbial toilet, just as if you hadn't cut it, they are also down. But when we cut it and laid it out wide in the morning, the photosynthesis rebuilt the sugars to the same level that was there the night before. But we don't have to worry about the risk of Clostridium butyric. So you don't have to cut at night to get high sugars. You need to cut it to a wide swath on a sunny day. And it'll continue to photosynthesize, and those sugars can't move to the roots, so it piles up in the plant. I guess it's a bit of a testimonial, but last year we heard you talking remote every day, and the dew was as early as we could get to it. And a lot of days I had to skip punch because we had to rake it at night. You what? We had to rake it to bail it by noon. Usually. Rake it to bail it by noon, yeah, because it dries so fast. Yeah. Yeah, that's what we've, I've had a bunch of farmers tell me if I cut it the night before and I cut it in the morning, the stuff in the morning's ready before the night before. So it actually dries faster. You just got to be able to cut fast enough is often a limitation. Yeah. Can you cut before the dew is off? Pardon me? Can you cut before the dew is off? Can you cut before the dew is off? And that's what this gentleman just said. The answer is yes, and that's what I found in mine. You can cut before the dew is off, but don't cut it into a swath. You cut it into a swath, you're going to capture two tons of liquid water per acre, which doesn't help drying at all. You don't want to crush it either. Yes, you don't need to crush it. Crushing is a waste of time, a waste of money. If you're making silage, there's no need for it. And it's just going to make it soak up water a whole lot more. I better keep moving if I'm going to get done. You're going to have to go back in time here pretty soon. You're going to have to go back in time. <laughs> you didn't tell me how much time, so that's your fault. The guys are late for lunch playing gym, all right? All right, now we're getting to another piece that you need to know about winter forages. <coughs> All winter grains have allelopathy. Allelopathy is compounds that come off of the plant itself. Uh, it keeps other plants from growing. See, I missed that. 
and it could restrict both weeds and the next crop. This was winter grains, this was my alleyways. The whole field was treated the same with a herbicide the previous fall, but after we harvested this in May, this picture was taken in July, and there is still nothing growing there because allelopathy is keeping the weeds out. Whereas in the alleyways where there's no allelopathy, we have a very nice uh, uh, giant uh, um, a ragweed and uh, a whole bunch of other weeds, lamps, quarters, pigweed stuff coming up in it. So you can use that to your advantage. And this is the part that we were talking about before. All right, <coughs> life gives you lemons. It gives you allelopathy. When life gives you lemons, you make lemonade. So what we did is we came in, harvested our triticale, and then went on and took all our haylage off. Because when the triticale comes off, your grass fields are ready, and then you go to your mixed grass alfalfa, and you finish up with your alfalfa fields. They're all the same quality. You get them off, unless you get a rainy day in there when you can get back out. But we come back in the beginning of June, and we plant our alfalfa or red clover. You can use a no-till drill like this. It does an awesome job. Uh, you can old, use an old piece of junk like I've got, uh, which ironically does a good job because it only needs to go in a quarter of an inch. The only time I had that not work is when we were extremely dry and the soil structure had been beat to death by previous cropping programs. I had some fields we were just getting back into shape again, and they were in lousy shape structure-wise, and so it didn't cut in and do a very good job. But if you have a no-till drill, it works very well. If you have a drill and you're going to pull a brilliant, uh, pull a culti packer behind it, don't even bother. It doesn't work. If you're going to broadcast the seed and pull a roller behind it, it does not work. If you're going to use a brilliant seeder to do this, it does not work. You need to cut a little groove to drop the seed so you have seed soil contact, and you need a press wheel following that unit, packing that down. Otherwise, it doesn't work. I can tell you right now, from bitter experience, it does not work. But we were talking before about better drills because we're going to use them for the triticale, we're going to use them for the sorghum and stands, and we're going to use them for this. You need to have a good piece of equipment to do this. I tried chisel plowing a strip to see if it made any difference and then planted across it. The only thing chisel plowing gave me was weeds. That's all I got out of it. Why? Because rocks. I broke the allelopathy barrier. Rocks, yeah. rocks. Yeah, you'll have rocks. Yeah, you'll pull up rocks too. Yep, we have a few of those. But you're going to have weeds. Uh, you're going to have rocks. Uh, and you're going to waste time doing it. There is absolutely no need uh, to do that. So. Ideally, if I take my triticale off, I would come right behind and put a uh, drill right in my um, uh, legume. You may get a little regrowth if you have a dry spring on the triticale. Normally, we don't get any regrowth. The second thing is, is I've tried this with thrown grass and alfalfa. The grasses will not grow. The allelopathy seems to kill it. From the limited experience I have so far, we're still testing it. So what I would do is plant my alfalfa, and when I take my first cutting of alfalfa off, I would come back in with my no-till drill and put any grass I want in. It was a question. What would you do if you were putting your sorghum out? If you were putting your sorghum out? Uh, very good point, because, I, let me see if I have that picture in here. Like I said, I have so many pictures, I can't remember where I'm at. Nope, I don't have it in there. If you're putting your sorghum out, I had a nice picture of sorghum on bare soil and the sorghum on the triticale was this high, the sorghum on the bare soil was this high. The allelopathy effect had stunted the sorghum and reduced the stand. It had also stunned corn. It killed out completely the teff, wiped it right out. It did not grow at all where there was winter grains. So if you're going to put sorghum in or you're going to put uh, teff in or a seeding with grass, you need to work that ground a bit to break that up. Now, if you're going to put sorghum in, you need more nitrogen anyway because you took a pile off. So put the manure on and then work it in immediately because you're capturing a huge amount of nitrogen, and that's going to break the allelopathic effect. We're trying to figure out ways to do it no till with corn, but we haven't figured it out yet. If you're planting soybeans, just no till them in. Soybeans work really well. Now, that type of seed, you can find more success with that than 
Well, I have better success with this than Brock City. I have better success than even plowing and disting and planting the field in April. To the point that this year I planted a whole bunch of Trinidad fields, and the sole purpose of them is to mow them off in May, and come back in with a no-till drill, and seed them to labor. It works so well. The first time I did it, I didn't tell anybody because it really scared me that if it works this well, I obviously know it works on So I went and told a whole bunch of people, and that's usually the kiss of death for a new idea. But in this case, it still continues to work well. Actually, did it work well? Yep. I guess the question, if it does work well for you to start it, does this still, still perform better? Seeing it that late now. Uh, see, well, obviously, yes, yeah, it's not supposed to work in June, right? But like I said, I was heck to raise as a kid because I raised the critical rules. I broke the rules on this. And uh, 2012 was the year I first did this. Uh, we had a half inch of rain after I did it. And then we had a third of an inch of rain at the end of June. And then the next rain was sometime in the middle of August. 2012 was really bad. Uh, then we had leaf hopper moving in July. So there was uh, uh, alfalfa and everything else around was the color of these, you know, was yellow. Like these walls, uh, like the trim is on these walls. But at the end of the season, one of the guys looked at this, he says it looked like a two-year-old off office stand. That's how good it came through all that trial. And you don't know why. Is it the microclimate from the stubble? Is it the fact that there's more air and water moving in now? Is it soil structure? We don't know what it is. It just seems to work awfully good. If I take my trivial for green, can I still follow the same Can you put your alfalfa into that? Uh, clover, if, uh, then I would look at putting my clover in uh, either cross-seeded or coming in with a no-till drill about green up in April. And the reason being is I don't want the clover too big. Because if the clover gets too big, it flowers, which means it's going to die, and it pulls the tray tail right down to the ground. Uh, the other piece of that um, is that once you get past flag leaf stage, Shading starts to severely limit the growth of the red clover. And we'll look over my able to see the green off and just uh, put the clover into the green and stuff. Oh, into the stubble? Yeah, you can do it there. Yeah. Yep. 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 That would work. Yep. Same thing. Is the little Japanese is specific to grass on grass? Uh, yeah. grass on At this is point, it? it's specific to grass on grass. Do I know everything about a little pathy? No. Uh, no self respecting. Plant scorer or pigweed plant will grow within four inches of a trick down. Uh, there is a real pet that keeps them out, a ragweed that keeps out. I don't know enough about it. I put manure, you think liquid manure neutralizes it. I put manure on it, it made no difference, but it's an all group because I planted it late enough. Three quarters of an inch of rain uh, to an inch of rain will reach out the real path and reduce that effect. But I don't know enough about it. it is exceedingly frustrating to work on because it doesn't happen every year. But when it happens, it can really take you to the cleaner. So that's why I'm just warning you about it. Uh, one thing that worked well for me at one time was uh, broadcasting red clover into a small grain. Late spring, and then hitting it with a time leader. Mm -hmm. It's kind of dual purpose, take out bees and put incorporate. I had a beautiful stand of clover. Mm -hmm. yep. Well, there's a lot of options we can do out there, yeah. But it's you got the you had the grain there to, to start with, which helps. Yeah. yeah, I got to wind up here. He's getting hungry. He's <laughs> Sorry. Okay, that's a stand uh, without any post-emergent herbicide. We're talking really good stands this far. Uh, harvesting. Uh, I've already talked about grazing it in the fall, and grazing it in the spring. Uh, we've taken it at soft dose stage for heifers and dry cows. It's a really good feed. Stage of growth is critical. If you're going to wake up for anything, you need to look at this. This is the stage right here you want to harvest it at, stage 9. Stage 8, it's rolled up in the stem. That's too soon. The difference in yield between here and here was 35%. This was on a Thursday. This was on the following Tuesday. You're laying down yield just like with the sorghum at a horrific rate. When we were milking 12,000 pounds of cow, this was fine. This is where you really need to be today. But two things. First of all, triticale goes down in quality slower than wheat or rye. That's some work that Jeff Liebert had just completed. And secondly, the temperature of the year affects it. 2010, it was a warm year. Quality went down. 2013, 
Uh, we were taking flag leave here, and if we had three feet of snow in northern New York, because it went really cold. So if it's a cold night, you can have a bigger window to harvest. I talked about this before, the deflector. Uh, it makes a whole bunch of lumps. So you need to open the back of that machine up and let it fly out. It dries a whole lot faster. Just don't go wiggy behind somebody's house where you got a lot of stones. Uh, the deflector down makes a whole bunch of pack stuff on triticale up. It made a very loose, porous swath that dried fast versus all the lumps when we had the deflector down. Uh, here's what I was talking about before. This is the clover study. Uh, this is the narrow row. It didn't dry very fast. The wide row with lumps didn't dry very fast. The wide row where we took off all the shields and let it fly out the back without lumps, uh, without tedding it, uh, at six, seven hours, we could have ensiled it. Same day. And this is where it mowed, where it rained the night before. If you're not getting it full width, I'm not going to do, we did this talk last year, you need to get it out wide. There's ways of doing that. Uh, tedding works very well with the clover. It also works with the triticale. This is conditioned versus not conditioned triticale. This is tedded triticale. Tedding makes a huge difference. Triticale, though, you're going into something that is three to four tons of dry matter. You need to slow down, or you'll rip the machine apart or make bumps at worst. Here is the clover study. The narrow, the, uh, the wide, with the lumpy one added into that, this is four studies. Uh, and this is wide tedding after two hours under horrible drying conditions. We still had it dry in 5.6 uh, hours. It was horrible because of the rain previous. It was a sunny day. You need a sunny day. What's the crop there? That's red clover. Red clover. Red clover. You're not supposed to dry it the same day you mow it. It works very well, really well. You need to put it into storage. You're going to bail this stuff, whether it's silage uh, or it's the uh, clover. You need to wrap it or put it into storage the same day that you mow it. And the reason being, and this holds for the, anybody who thinks they're going to lay their sorghum cinnamon out overnight and let it sit. But this is the sugars that are lost in alfalfa overnight. You're losing 13% of the dry matter. That's all sugars and you're increasing clusterity in the interior. You need to ensile it the same day uh, that you mow it. <coughs> How does frost affect all of this? How does frost affect it? Uh, for which crop? Well, let's say sorghum and, and sudan grasses. Sorghum and sedan grasses. And if it's a very light frost, frost, well, first of all, it doesn't matter what the frost is. If you're going to mow it and ensile it and let it ferment and sit there for like a month, it's not going to hurt it at all because it all dissipates during fermentation. So, yeah, somebody's looking for me. Uh, you're going to be here for lunch, aren't you? Or yes, I'll be here for lunch. lunch. Yeah. So, you know, we, uh, they can grab lunch and I can still keep answering questions if they'd like. Well, we have another speaker now. No, oh, lunch is oh, now. <laughs> Thank you for getting them hungry. You start salivating before we go. No, we have another talk we want to do. And, um, but then after lunch, as we normally do, we, you know, we open it up for discussion and hopefully Tom will be around here to answer those questions.